Hi, I'm Jamie. This is Dead Dodge Garage, and this is a 1967 Dodge Charger in the right color. I'm in a lot of the Mopar emotional support groups on Facebook, and one of those is the B-Body Mopar group. I happened to see a post by an owner looking for some help tuning his car. It has a shiny brand new built big block and it just doesn't run right. This is kind of a recurring theme in this hobby, something I've talked about a lot. Overbuilding an engine, picking a bunch of you know, race car parts that you really don't need just to cruise to the grocery store and buy milk. Now it just so happens that the owner of this fine specimen lives about an hour and a half away from me. So naturally I responded to the post and said, ah, oh, I think this is a job for me. And here it is. Now I used to own a 66 Charger. In fact, you can see it on the channel in a few videos, most notably my series called The Three Pedal Solution, where I installed a four speed in it. The 67 is almost exactly the same, except for a couple choice details. One, these turn signal indicators. On a 66, this piece just continues straight down there. It doesn't have the light or the frat sog. Second, and maybe most importantly, the center console. In a 66 Charger only, the console actually extends all the way from the front to the back. There's a nice finish panel on there, and this rear armrest, which flips down, is bigger. Unfortunately, this was a problem for rear seat passengers. If you parked on a busy street and you wanted both your kids to get out on this side, whatever kids over there had to crawl over the center console, and it was a huge pain. So in 67, they did away with that. This is the same basic B-body center console that was used in other cars in 66, and all of them from 67 to 70. There are special top plates for the 66 Charger. They are kind of like a brushed aluminum texture, I guess. And then also the Charger uses this armrest, which was not found in other models. It's not present on this unit, but on some of these shorter center consoles, there's actually a seam here where this piece was bolted on. The seam, of course, is where the rear section of the 66 Charger console would have been attached. Of course, there's this fancy trim piece on this, which 66 would lack. And this one isn't even cracked, which is really surprising. They are normally broken. Huh. The gauges are something that's unique to the 66 and 7 Charger. The big four pod gauges. Now this cluster has kind of been reconditioned and it's painted silver. That should be black back there. Oh, well, that's interesting. That panel has been uh, repainted at some point. This whole interior has definitely been restored. You can see evidence that these are new seat covers on the back seats. Ah, yes, that does remind me, there's the other difference between 66 and 7. 67 has this vertical pattern on the seat. On 66, the pattern runs that way. The four bucket seats are really cool and unique in the B-body line to these chargers. <sighs> the party piece is all of that folds down and then that panel folds down into the trunk and you can fit all kinds of stuff in here. You can even camp in these cars really easily. You just throw a mattress down on all that. I've never actually been in a 67 Charger before. I've never seen this. That's pretty neat. You know, so your kids can light their cigarettes or whatever. I've gone on record as saying that the 66 and 7 Charger interior is like the best. And as much as I love the 68 to 70, the second generation of the Charger, they just don't quite have the same flair. There aren't as many nice little touches. And really, most of it's shared with other B-bodies, whereas this interior is bespoke to the Charger. Headliner board, also unique, and also very red. I love these jeweled looking floor shifters too. I still have the one I took out of my 66. Early 66 cars like mine have dishes here. Later 66 and 67s have these deep openings with the little needle points in the middle. Now these cars have electroluminescent gauge backlighting. They don't use light bulbs. The plates and the needles glow. Everything here glows green and the needles glow orange. The owner of this car says that the lights did work when he bought it, but they don't work now. Now, of course, these cars have hideaway headlights. And unlike the 68 and 9 cars, these use electric motors, one on each headlight door and the headlights actually rotate themselves. They don't hide back behind that door. Of course, when the lights are closed, you get that shaver look. It's pretty cool. All of that is metal, and it's also all very heavy. And the trim's not even falling off the hood on this one. I thought that was a standard feature. Anyway, here we are under the hood, and we're looking at one of my favorite engines of all time, 
the 383 low deck big block. Now, as far as we know, this is the original 383. The number stamping here reads C383, which indicates 1967. Honestly, it's not that important in a car like this, but I'm pretty sure this is original. Now, this is not an original four barrel car. If it was an original four barrel car here on the fender, it would say 383 four barrel, but it says V8. The V8 badge was used for the 318 poly engines, the 361 when they were available for part of 1966, and the 383 two barrel. Any other engine would have a displacement call out right there. For example, a 426 Hemi car would say so. That was an option in these years. In fact, the 66 Charger was one of the very first street Hemi cars. Someday, I want to own one. This engine was recently treated to a performance rebuild. And like many performance builds, they kind of got a little excited. Now, the owner of the car didn't really make these decisions. Someone else essentially said, hey, I know what you want. Now, I haven't actually seen the cam card, but I have a pretty good idea of what it is, just judging by the sound and the way it's running. That is a factory Mopar type distributor with the factory timing curve, and this engine doesn't like it. So we're going to get into that. I also happen to notice that the float level, at least in the primary side of this brawler carburetor, was much, much too low. We'll kind of go over this carburetor in general. It's a four corner idle setup, so it's got idle mixture screws front and rear. So we're definitely going to tweak those, balance it between front and rear, and just kind of make sure it can run as well as possible. All of that is tomorrow Jamie's problem because it's Sunday and I've got a Christmas tree to decorate before my live stream. So we'll catch up with this car then. Mmm, breakfast. Dang it, I thought that was a spork. Nah. I know I mentioned this before, but I used to have a 66. I owned that car for like nine years and did tons of interesting things with it. I could drove it to California once. Almost got arrested. That's a long story. Pulling this car into the shop, I realize this is a lot worse than timing. I'm actually not exactly sure what I'm going to find here. This thing is just like bucking and it's doing really weird stuff. The timing was already super advanced too, so let's dig in. So what's a cold start like? I have a guess. Yeah. Okay, it did start. Notice the tack works, which is really peculiar. Those are usually broken. Seriously, this thing just runs bad. And not like big cam, cold-blooded bad, just regular bad. All right, put a little load on it. It'll kind of move and then die. Oh yeah, this isn't why it's here, but uh, it's got new brakes and the pedal is, well, it's a two pump setup, so. I should probably crack the bleeders while I'm at it. I did mention this is not my car, right? It doesn't seem to matter how many times I say that. People still assume these are my cars. I'm not rich, folks. I've got one charger. That's cool, but uh, I can't afford seven. Oh, during testing, I did unhook the vacuum advance, which is run to full-time vacuum, and tweak the distributor location. So far, that hasn't helped at all. You can barely, barely see fuel in that window there. This is a Brawler Series Holly. They're like all the rage these days. It's very similar to an old school Holly. Adjustment procedures are gonna be the same, basically. The float level adjustments for Holly are here. This is just kind of a set screw. The 5 8 hex nut there is actually the adjustment for the needle. As the needle backs out, the float level rises. As the needle goes in, the float level comes down. It's relatively easy to do. I usually prefer to do this with the engine running, and that way you get a real-time update, you know? You'll be able to see where the fuel level's going. This thing doesn't really want to stay running currently, so I think I'm just going to raise both of them a hair and then move on. And here's what that looks like. Large flathead in one hand, 5 eighths wrench in the other. Be aware, as you loosen this, you're probably going to get pressurized fuel leaking out. Loosen the set screw, turn the hex one way or the other, and then tighten the set screw again. And be aware there's a gasket under the screw and then another gasket under the nut. It's really easy to damage those, so take care, do this slowly. Um, otherwise, gas leaks, my favorite. Really a regular feature of the Holly and a good reason why I'm not a big fan. Oh yeah, gas everywhere, there's a good bit of pressure. It's just part of the Holly experience. Every operation involves gas on the outside. Jet change, float adjustment, I guess that's really it. Just make sure you're prepared for the mess. Covering your engine in gas and then firing it up, 
probably not a great idea. Four corner idling. The front idle screws were at two and a quarter turns out. The rears were at a turn and a half. Now in my experience, usually with these four corner setups, you're gonna want a turn to a turn and a half each. Now I don't know about the version of Jamie Tucky in that clip, but this version of Jamie has found three quarter turns out on those four corner idle screws to be a pretty normal setting as well. Your engine's gonna tell you what it wants. I'd say three quarter to a turn and a quarter out. The other thing we could do is fully close the rear blades, close the rear idle screws, and set it up as just two corner idling on the front primaries. But I kind of like the four corner setup, mainly because it runs fuel through the rear bowl. Some of these fancy performance four corner idle hollies have a screw up here, like the front, the primaries, to adjust the idle speed at the back. Unfortunately, this one doesn't. It just has the standard screw under here, which is really dumb and annoying to get to. I'm officially getting confused. I think we actually have an ignition problem here, and not really a fuel problem. So I'm gonna dig into the basics. I'm gonna look under the distributor cap, make sure it looks happy. The coil's already been tested, but I might test it again. And I'm gonna make sure the firing order is right. It doesn't sound like it's wrong, but it also sounds absolutely terrible. Firing order is correct. I did reorganize the wires in that holder. Pro tip there, uh, for easy diagnosis later, it's really, really helpful to keep those in some semblance of order. I have noticed that this distributor was stabbed in 180 out and the wires have been changed to accommodate for that. Not really that important, honestly. It works fine. Normally the vacuum pod is also pointing roughly that way. Firing order's right, get the timing right. It doesn't matter which way the distributor's pointed really. All right, inside the distributor here and things actually look pretty good, except for this. What is this? Oh, I know what it is. It's the pin that's supposed to clock the points plate and the vacuum advance unit as you screw all that together. Huh, I wonder how it ended up there. This is a replacement factory type electronic ignition distributor. It came with a kit uh, it was included with this fancy high rev Mopar type ignition box. I think I figured out the problem. The thought occurred to me, that reluctor wheel, oh, sorry, different prop. That reluctor wheel, you know, like this one, is the same part between a clockwise distributor used in a small block and a counterclockwise distributor used in a big block. If you can see in there, it has two different roll pin locations. You see the two arrows there. One is pointed clockwise, one is pointed counterclockwise. If you install this the wrong way, the phasing of that reluctor will be off by quite a bit. And it won't line up correctly with the way the rotor is pointing at the cap, which could do really weird things. It appears that whoever assembled this distributor put it in the small block position and not the big block position. Eh, just dual feed holly things. Well, and big block things in general. The feed hose always ends up right in the way of the distributor stuff. Notice I've got the closest tooth on the reluctor lined up there, and I've got the rotor gap there pointed roughly the same direction. Look at this one. It's kind of pointed straight at the pickup, almost. Look how far off that one is. That difference again, it's kind of straight that way. It's kind of not that straight at all. So that's the difference here. It basically ch totally changes the rotor phasing that is the position in which the spark occurs with relation to the little tab for a given cylinder on the distributor cap. It doesn't look like much, but it's a big difference. Notice also, this is a reproduction reluctor wheel and it does not have the arrow markings that the original ones have. So, easy mistake to make, I guess. There's a better look at those pin positions as well. Notice this one is perfectly aligned with that tooth and this one shows offset. So that gives you your two different positions. This one, same deal, harder to see, but the pin that is aligned with the tooth is pointed that way. Not so on this one, it's flipped the other way around. The pot thickens. Here's a look at the roll pins. Neither of them actually extends down into the slot. Also there are two, there's only supposed to be one. It looked like it was lined up with the clocking hole, but backwards, you know. I don't know, maybe these guys know something I don't, but that pin is what keeps that reluctor from spinning. Here's a look at the stock one. One pin right in that slot, no pin on the other side. And that's what locates it. I've never seen this before. I don't think it's a common problem having these assembled wrong. Uh, and I have no idea how I knew to look. Just use the force, I guess. That's the lesson. 
Wah, wah. Apparently there's a machining difference with the new shafts too. Here's one more view at the offset there. It's kind of hard to tell. The one hole is dead nuts lined up with the tooth. And this one where the roll pin is now that will extend into that gap is not. It's offset slightly. Yay, back together. As I was saying, usually these distributors are installed in give or take this position. Now notice where the rotor is pointing. The rotor is pointing to this contact right next to that lower metal strap. So this is where we want to put number one. The slot there, that is what engages with the oil pump drive. Look where that slot is currently pointed. In relation to the vacuum pod, it's almost 90 degrees. That slot faces front and back, almost, kinda, it's close. Assuming the timing mark is correct on this engine, which we can't do just yet, but it's definitely close, this gear, the slot should be facing roughly front and rear, and it's not, so we're gonna adjust that. This is a big flathead screwdriver, and it is my friend today. You stab it in the gear, and oh, if it will move, you spin the gear counterclockwise up and out. It walks itself out of that cam gear. We're gonna jump it over one tooth, two teeth. Okay, notice it's not perfectly straight front and back. That, in my experience, is what they're supposed to look like. Again, if it's off by a tooth, you can't account for that, but this will put the wires in roughly the factory position. You know, if you go look up the factory diagram, everything will match what you have on the car. So that's how I like to set them up. Let's move on. Hey, don't forget to plug your distributor back in. Not that I made that mistake this time, I'm just saying. Total eyeball guess on the timing. So uh, let's see what it's like. Might be a little late. Shocking. I always try to eyeball the timing and I'm like always, always not advanced enough. Mm, contact. Okay, that didn't really make any difference. Only hardcore Mopar people will understand that this is wrong. <laughs> well, the good news is there's more spare ignition stuff here. If it comes to that, I only just noticed these are those fancy stealth heads. The main way of telling is there's no opening surrounding the uh, heat cross over there, which is non-existent. They're really well hidden under that paint. That's what's so cool about them. Just for science, I tested a spare module. Yeah, no dice. Moving on. All right, I'm scratching my head. Somehow it's worse. It's acting like there is zero idle fuel. I've gone in and out with the front idle screws. I've got them at some ridiculous number of turns right now. I've pulled them out, blown out the passageways. I've disconnected the tachometer, just in case that was the issue. Nope. I've worked through all kinds of things. I've had the timing back and forth, the firing order's definitely correct, but it won't idle at all. It's acting like it's got the world's largest vacuum leak, but it definitely doesn't. I'm getting a headache, but I think I have another solution. If not a solution, something worth testing. <laughs> this, yeah, it's only like exactly the same carburetor. I wonder what that does. Horrible gas mask three. Uh, three fast, three furious. I have this. So for science, let's see what's what. Far as I know, this one is almost brand new. I don't know that it's actually ever been on an engine. It's got the throttle adapter for the Chrysler, just like the one I just pulled off. So yeah, it's really pretty much same for same. Are blown power valves still a thing? I don't know. Dual feed Holly. Leaks. It's like the name of the game from these washers from the flare fittings, from the needle adjustment points, from the bull screws, friggin' everywhere. So, what you wanna do, with no ignition, crank your engine, or power up your electric fuel pump, I guess, and fill the bowls. Watch for leaks. Whole lot easier to do that now, safely, than with the engine fired up. Engine fuel. No leaks, which is miraculous, but I had to raise the rear float slightly and lower the front one. Let's see if we get good fire or bad fire. 
So just flooded to crap, I guess. Okay, well, it's actually continuing to run now. That's a nice start. Hey, funny story. This thing basically doesn't charge. Also, it's trying to die. Why are you trying to die? Quit it. I'm so confused by all of this. These plugs don't look the best. Of course, they're special 5.8 hex plugs to fit in those heads. So the many, many standard champion plugs I have around won't fit. In the case of charging system problems on these classic Mopars, it's almost always the voltage regulator. Another common issue I've discussed on the channel, the integrity of the charge output circuit from the alternator to the battery, which of course goes through the firewall connector and the amp gauge. In this case, it's perfect. Okay, it does charge kind of, but the output is not great. I am really a small block guy, so this makes sense, but like two distributors out of 30 or however many are tucked into all these bins were big block. I found the distributor I took off the charger. It was in this cart and covered in red grease. This distributor did work perfectly well, except that the vacuum module is bad because of course it is. This is the distributor that was in this 67 charger. It's got a Pertronics igniter in it, which failed. I think I know why it failed. It's uh, not securely attached to anything. The vacuum pot on this, yeah, it's bad too. That means of every single one of these distributors I've come up with, the only good vacuum advance pod is that one. This is just ridiculous. Oh yeah, building junk and a garbage. Well, that took a truly absurd amount of time. And honestly, the parts I'm using suck. This is just a proof of concept. I'm gonna throw this thing in and see if the car magically runs better. If it does, then I know it's a problem with that shiny brand new distributor beyond what I've already fixed. Points distributor, tested. Works, lined up properly, timed properly-ish, will not fire. It's sparking, but it will not fire. Tested a different coil, tested a different different coil, will not fire. Maybe this will fix everything wrong with today. Maybe. That is distributor number four. I'm five hours into this project. I don't know if you can tell by looking, but I've had to crank it like that. And the engine will start, barely. Still sounds super, super retarded. I don't know what's going on, but I'm about to lose it. It won't start. It'll kind of sort of start. And then it fireballs out the carb. Sounds like it has good compression. And as near as I can tell, the cam gear is still where I put it. Meaning it didn't pop out during any of the distributor changes. And also seeming to indicate that the cam timing is not changing. It makes no sense. I am not having a good time. All right, well, forget everything I said about cam timing seeming to be right-ish, because it's not. Here's overlap. Why is the cam advanced like a whole ton? This is why. This is why we can't have nice things. This is not where I thought today was going. I thought this was a video about distributors. Hello. <sighs> That dot should be here. Why is it not? I thought this might be loose. It's not, it's definitely tight. That's good. Well, it's a huge pain with all the rocker arms on, but I was able to put the gear back on and turn the cam counterclockwise. It's almost lined up. Gotta tweak it a little bit. We'll get the chain back in place and then we'll do the uh, quick, fast and easy way of verifying the cam timing. I sent a picture of this misery over to Donnie, the big ranch tech, and he figured out exactly what they did immediately. I don't know how I didn't. They must have put the keyway straight up and lined that up with the dot. It's so wrong, I wouldn't even think of it. Don't do that. The keyway points off at an angle, kind of toward number one, the circle, or, you know, whatever other markings you've got on your adjustable crank gear like this. All right. Dot to dot, gears and chains reinstalled, and I don't have enough fingers to hold a feeler gauge, but that matches what I saw with them on the base circle. It's fixed, I guess, except that I still have to put it all back together. It's all ready for gaskets and parts and stuff. So we'll revisit this tomorrow. 
I'm gonna go pass out. I'm tired. Something about trying to start a hundred year old canoe engine. Yay! Oil slinger. Make sure you install it and make sure you install it dish out. You can install it this way and then it'll grind itself to pieces, which is a pretty cool trick. Seen that a couple times actually. Yay, it's back together. Except for this stuff. More on that in a minute. Anyway. Rocker arm adjustment. Notice this has the fancy 440 source heads and the fancy bleh, 440 source arms and fancy 3 8 push rods, which were cut to a custom length and heads that were modified to clear them since normally you have to use the 5 16 which honestly is perfectly adequate, especially for what this car is gonna do. Anyway, the money's already been spent, so I gotta make this stuff work. Notice here, I've got the adjusters kind of just below the top of the nut. When I got in here, as you may have seen in earlier shots, they were all over the place. Some were up like this, some are way, way down. So I thought it would probably be prudent to figure out why. The answer is, I don't know. Did they just throw darts? I don't know, because there's no rhyme or reason to where they're set. So what I'm doing is loosening them all up and setting them to about a half turn of preload. That'll give us the best protection against floating valves, but it should also prevent annoying rattling noises. Notice they're kind of ending up there. Not exactly consistent. I wouldn't expect them to be all exactly the same, but I just don't know why these are buried like that. They're almost in the bottom of the hydraulic lifter. And you're just asking for valve float by setting your rockers up that way. Now there are plenty of ways to skin this cat too. A half a turn, it's really not a lot of preload. You can run zero lash, but in some cases your lifters will fall apart and it will make more noise. So basically I'm pretending this is a performance Chevrolet. I've got this rocker on the base circle now. Okay, and I'm gonna take the lash out. You can do this by feeling the push rod feeling the way the arm moves. There we go. Just got drag on the push rod there. And then I'm going to take a ratchet, mess everything up, trying to film this. And whoop, I'm going to preload it with a half turn. Done. Well, except for running the lock nut down. Make sure those are tight too. The uh, studs in those adjustable rockers, two different Allen wrench sizes. And I actually cannot find a proper fit for the larger ones, standard or metric. That's eh, close enough. Anyway, now they're all adjusted. And I'm curious if it will sound any different when it's cranking. Hmm, yeah, it sounds more even. Let's go over to the other side and see what's what. Adjusted. Sometimes it can take a couple rotations. Valve covers, coolant, fire. Oh, and maybe reconnect the coil wire for the seventh time. Back together, ready to party. Except for two things. One, coolant, heater hoses. That can wait for a minute. Two, I need to restab the distributor and the drive gear. Same procedure. Pop the distributor out, aim that gear roughly front and back, slightly down. Restab the distributor with it pointing at number one. Oh, just a little off. Yeah, three teeth. Well, there you go. Remember, the distributor rotation is counterclockwise, so when the rotor was like all the way over here, extremely, extremely retarded. And there isn't enough room, like physically, to crank the distributor to the point that it would be workable. Big money or fireballs, one or the other. I guess it's big money. Definitely needed more timing. Maybe not that much more. It actually sounds good now. Other than the mild tuning issues. That's weird. All right, anyway, we've got something we can work with. Tuning required. Well, here's what it starts like now. So that's pretty close. I've got it sitting at like 24 degrees base right now. Can I actually put it in gear? Yes. 
This is so much better than it was. Oh, things are going so much better now. The engine actually responds to normal tuning changes. It does what it's supposed to, and that's great. I'm gonna take a break from the engine and jump over to suspension and brake stuff. Ride height on your classic Mopar. The height of the front end is adjustable. These things are equipped with torsion bars, and the great thing about them is the one anchor at the front in the uh, lower control arm has a bolt you can use to adjust the preload on that torsion bar, thus raising or lowering the front end of the car. It's not at all uncommon for owners of these cars to want the front ends to sit dirt nasty low. So they break out the three quarter socket, the half inch ratchet, and they crank those adjusters down as far as they can go until the suspension is sitting on the lower bump stops, just like this car was when I bought it. Now this will come as a shock, but lowering the bars all the way and setting your car on the bump stops is not a good idea. How do you get the suspension ride height correct? Well, that kind of depends on who you ask. If you crack open the factory service manual, as all the old timers are instantly gonna tell you to do, there is a weird procedure in there that involves measuring the difference in height from the K-frame to the lower control arm and then doing math with that. Or you can do it completely the wrong way, which is what I do, and measure to the wheel lip. There is absolutely zero guarantee that the wheel lips match from side to side. And that is almost certainly why the factory didn't do it that way. But it works pretty well. You know, who's going to notice a quarter of an inch side to side? No one. Well now, this is interesting. Both sides are on the bump stop on this car. The driver's side just happens to be more on the bump stop. Here's a look at the passenger side. Notice that the upper arm is sitting like straight across. This is not ideal. What I do is aim for half an inch to three quarters of an inch of a gap above that bump stop. That usually gives a decent rake, but a bit of suspension travel, and the upper arm ends up sitting in a much more favorable position. Just for science, here's a quick look under my 68 Charger. This thing was on the bumps when I bought it. Remarkably, it really didn't ride that badly, but I raised it up just that little bit. The arm still doesn't really look right, it wants to be much higher than this. When I'm trying to go for a stock appearing ride height, I kind of try to split the difference between those two bump stops. See how there's a much larger gap to the upper one than the lower one? I try to get that like, I don't know, here somewhere. But this works well for a lowered front end appearance and it sort of kind of handles okay. Here's my preferred torsion bar adjustment setup. A three quarter deep socket and a really long ratchet handle. Notice I'm doing this on the ground. Ideally, you want the weight off of the suspension to make this adjustment. For one thing, it's a whole lot easier. The problem is, as soon as you get the tires off the ground, you're then going to have to set the car back down, roll it back and forth several times, slam on the brakes, try and get the suspension to settle back to where it was. I make these adjustments on the ground, and as I'm doing that, I push up lightly on the car to take a little bit of load off of the bolt, and that seems to help. After I make an adjustment, I get out and bounce the front end up and down a good bit, and that usually seems to settle it well enough. I'll also note I need to clean up a bit of an antifreeze mess. The main reason I'm adjusting the suspension height is to fix the tire rub problem on the driver's side. I've gone up a little bit, notice the gap there between the bump stop and its little metal pad thingy. It may be hard to tell from this perspective, but the driver's side is slightly higher. There's a bigger gap there. So why does the body still measure a half inch lower on this driver's side? Well, Few possibilities. Firstly, these cars were never really built the best to begin with. And little differences from side to side, not to be unexpected. These fenders, side to side, no guarantee they're hung exactly the same. Then however, life happens. And sometimes front end accidents happen. In the case of the purple 69 charger I aligned a few weeks ago, I had to do the same thing. I had to stagger the arm adjustments to get the body to sit level. That's because the frame rail, though not badly damaged, was slightly tweaked and nothing hung quite the way it was supposed to. This car has also been repaired. I have to say, compared to that 69, much better job. The body panels actually hang nicely, the hood lines up, everything looks really good. The radiator support has been cut out and replaced, and that's probably the root of my problem here. Well, I think I'm going to have to stop there. I'm not having any luck getting it leveled out side to side, but I have checked. We've got plenty of tire clearance now. I don't want to ruin the stance, you know? I want it to sit pretty level. 
Don't want it super nose high, and that's kind of how it'll end up if I keep going. Oh, my private lake is filling up again. Lovely. You have to understand, making adjustments to the ride height can be affected by so many things. The construction of the body, previous damage, the rear suspension, the amount of air in the tires. It's a dynamic system. Steady. This car has been converted to factory type disc brakes, well, at least from the 70s. So I'm happy to see this hand adjustable proportioning valve. You can use that to turn the brake pressure going to the rears down to prevent premature rear brake lockup. Not having that with a disc brake conversion like this, probably a bad idea. Been there, learned that. There is a bent sway length there. Maybe it was on there when the little front end boo-boo happened, I don't know. Other than that, things look pretty good under here, except for one thing. I brought this to the owner's attention and I wanna bring it to yours too. This thing has shiny new ball joints on it, nice looking tie rods, you know, a bunch of fresh suspension pieces. When it was a part to do the disc brakes though, there's one other thing you really should have done. This is your lower control arm bushing on drugs. These are always bad. This is just what happens. I guarantee you they're bad on my charger, on my demon, on everything else in the fleet. Factory, they're rubber bushing, and with all of the flex that's put on them as the suspension moves through its travel, they just kind of crack and disintegrate. And for that reason, when I rebuild these suspensions, I only use polyurethane lower control arm bushings. I highly recommend you do that if you're gonna go through your suspension. The polyurethane is great. You leave the steel shell that surrounded the original bushing in place, grease the polyurethane, and install it into that. With the polyurethane in place, there's no more binding. The arm is allowed to move through its travel with no resistance. It stays solid and it works really well. The transmission was apparently rebuilt by some gentleman named Dirty Dan. Dirty Dan appears to fancy himself a bit of an artist. Ooh, shiny new floor panel on the driver's side. That's normal. I do have to say, unlike a lot of cars I end up going in behind people and fixing, this one was nicely put together. All the hardware looks good, things are tight where they should be, all the little bits are correct. That's really nice to see. Honestly, if the timing chain had been installed correctly by the engine builder, I don't think Travis and his brother would have needed my help at all. Let's bleed some brakes. My technique here, gravity bleeding. Get a rag in place, crack the valve open, and let her rip. Usually, air bubbles will collect right there. Any air trapped in the caliper should come out first. There might be a lot in there, judging by how I haven't seen any fluid yet. Okay, we've got fluid on the driver's side, at least. And air bubbles. Like, a lot. Okay. Yeah, I guess they just didn't finish bleeding these brakes when they installed them. There we go. Most excellent. I need more hands. I don't know which is worse. Brake fluid or duck poop? For some reason, both have been on my boot in the last week. It's gotta be better. Can't possibly be worse. We'll see if the pedal still has a squishy feel. It might require a bit more bleeding. Reinstall the original carburetor and it's instantly terrible again, so. I'm gonna try to figure that out, I guess, before I give up. I've had idle screws in and out. I've blown through the passages. I've balanced front and rear. I closed the rear screws. I opened the front ones way up like they were before. This thing will not idle with this carburetor at all. It makes no sense. And I'm running out of time. So I'm gonna put my perfectly good carb back on. Give it enough time, I'm sure I could figure this out. It might have something to do with the fact that these auto screws do not fit this metering plate right. Now the good news is I'm getting really, really fast at swapping them out. Fire's right out, guns men again. Notice I now have the vacuum advance connected, ported, as Chrysler would have done factory. We may mess with that a little bit. It sounds like it's gonna be pretty happy here. My love letter to the manifold vacuum for your advanced pod crowd. I set the base timing to 16 degrees. As you can see, we're sitting at 16 degrees. Give or take a hair. Even a brand new timing chain is a little sloppy. That's fine. Notice the vacuum pod is connected to manifold vacuum. And yet, it is adding no timing. It will add no timing until I rev this engine up a little bit. Then there's enough vacuum to pull the pod, and then it gets a whole crap ton of advance all at once. With this cam, that's probably the best we're gonna get. Unless I crank more base advance in. 
I dial more bass advance in, then there's more vacuum. All of a sudden, there's a bunch more vacuum available to pull the vacuum advance. And then it becomes like a snake eating its own tail. You can have this much vacuum, or you can have all of it. It's just a tough balance. Now, on these factory vacuum pods, there is an Allen in there to adjust them. And if I adjust it to the point that it will work on less vacuum, maybe it will do more. But personally, I choose to forgo that option and recurve the distributor instead. Now I've done a whole video about welding up the slots in your distributor to change your curve. And I'm not gonna cover every detail of that here, but I'm breaking this distributor down and we'll take a quick look at it. This is interesting, this aftermarket dealy bob, which came from High Rev with their box, has a screw holding the top section in. Well, that's cool, except that the screw was loose. Normally there's a really, really annoying clip in here, so I do like this better. Here's the advance mechanism. You can see the slots there. I want to eliminate about half of this travel. I mapped this distributor out. It had 20 degrees of advance. I drew a line, which now that I'm looking at it again, isn't really half. If I ended up with a 10 to 12 degree curve, I'll be happy. There we go. That looks pretty good. Compare the size of that slot to that slot. The pin fits in that slot twice. I'd say it fits in that one about one and a half times. So we should be really close. Now I just need to file that up. Oh, it's perfect and beautiful in every way. Also, for science, I removed the heavy spring and put in a super light one. We'll see what that does. It should do more advancing faster. Okay, funny enough, that ended up being 16 degrees. It's a step in the right direction. I've now got it at 20 base, 36 total, and I did hook the vacuum back up. We'll see what that's like on a drive. First, I gotta retune the idles again. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure this thing is out of gas. All right, I decided to be smart. Five gallons of premium down the gullet, and it didn't even blow up yet. I got a different regulator, so I'm gonna replace that new regulator with another new regulator and see if that changes anything. But I am not holding my breath. Is it a good sign that the new one is literally identical to the one I took out? Okay, better. there. Definitely an improvement, but I would still expect to see more than that when it's revved up. There's just nothing like replacing new parts with new parts, is there? Every single piece that I've had a problem with here was brand new. Do with that information what you will. Huh. You said the headlights rotated, but they don't. Motors work fine. Relays clicking, but no power is getting to the Headlight motors. Oh well, they're open now. I hereby declare this 67 charger open. Time for a test drive in the dark, in the rain. Oh yes, in case you were curious, the brakes are perfect. Super firm now. But do the wipers work? No, no they don't. At least the tack does. Oh, the temperature gauge works too. The oil gauge isn't connected. That means the fuel gauge should work. Headlights need some aiming. So about those brakes. I'm not sure what the deal is. It'll build up enough vacuum for one hit and then there's nothing. In fact, usually there's just nothing. So I'm guessing bad brake booster. I wonder if check valve could do that. Blinker works. Nice. Hmm. Well, it shifts nice and firm. Will it kick down? Yes, it will. <laughs> nice. Front end needs an alignment quite badly. So we're gonna keep it under, let's say 35. When the booster works, whoo, it works. When it doesn't, not good. So far, no third gear. Where's third gear? It's just not, there it is. In the camera, the headlights look decent. They aren't. 
This thing would definitely benefit from headlight relays. I put those on my 66 and it had the best headlights of anything in the fleet. Seriously. These cars are just the coolest. The full width taillight, the fastback roof you can't see in the dark. Yeah, absolutely fantastic evening for a test drive, especially with no wipers. Hey, it runs. It runs pretty well. It drives. It really needs to be broken in more. Hey, the heater and defrost work. That's nice. Oh yeah, that's the nicest mode switch I've ever felt. The owner says the electroluminescent lighting did work. I will bet you there is a short somewhere. That's usually what happens. There's a light here, there's one in the radio, and then of course the individual gauges and needles. Oh yeah, don't worry about that temp gauge reading. That's totally wrong. It's actually 190, which is perfect. Oh yeah, and that amp gauge works too. I don't know about you guys, but I learned a lot on this one. Or did I learn the same thing again and again and again? Scrutinize everything. Take nothing for granted, especially new parts. The lights dim when I turn the wipers on, so I guess that's a wiper motor problem. Yeah, in real life, I'm pretty much totally blind now. I promise you, that is an illusion. The visibility is terrible. This thing needs headlight bulbs and headlights aimed and relays would be huge. That didn't even feel like a booster problem. That felt like a hydraulic problem. So now they're great again. This is just weird. At least the engine is mostly happy. Oh look, an LLV. Again, this is a new engine, so I'm not fully testing it. I'm also trying to limit the idling, although there has been a good bit of that involved in this tuning process. Overall, I'm pretty happy with it. Yep, next stop alignment shop. That'll help a lot. Oh yeah, the more it runs, the better it's sounding. It almost starts too easily. Ah, uh, here's one of my other favorite features on the 66.7 Charger. The hidden evil running lights. To get the full effect, you really need the headlights closed. Oh, there's so much more to do on this thing, but my time with it is up. I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time we get a quality Mopar in here. Shouldn't be too long. And remember, experience is something you get just after you need it. Mm -hmm. There's a marching band playing Christmas music in the dark in the rain.